All right, so, you know, uh, if you've been around here for a while, you know that uh, I, I love the old Peanuts cartoon, and there's, uh, there's an old Peanuts cartoon uh, with uh, Linus and Lucy, and they're standing at a window, and they're looking outside, and it's absolutely pouring rain, and Lucy says, look at the rain. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus, being the, the, the young theologian that he is, he says, oh, it will never do that. Uh, in the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that it would never happen again, and the sign of the promise is the rainbow. And Lucy's been looking at him as he's been speaking, and then she turns and looks back out the window, and she has a big smile on her face, and she says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus responds, sound theology has a way of doing that. Sound theology has a way of doing that. Now, there are a few subjects that have created more unrest and weighed more heavily on people's minds than the subject of eternal security. Simply stated, the question is, can a Christian ever lose his or her salvation? In other words, once a person has trusted Christ and receives new life through the Holy Spirit, can that person become unsaved by drifting away or even out and out renouncing their faith in Christ? And that's a question that has been debated for hundreds of years and argued by believers in different denominations. Many believers have struggled with knowing for sure whether or not they are really saved. Many have wondered about a loved one, a family member, a friend who at one point in their life had a close walk with the Lord, but then something happened and now they want nothing to do with God want nothing to do with the church. And the question is, are those people saved? Or did, did they lose their salvation or were they just never really saved to start with? And to answer that question, what we need most is sound theology. Truth that's based squarely on God's word and not on feelings or logic or, or opinions. We, we need to know what God has said and rest our case there. So the question is, does the Bible really teach once saved, always saved? Uh, can a believer really have the assurance of their salvation? And the verses that we're gonna look at this morning give one of the clearest answers to this question in all of the Bible. So take your copy of God's Word, uh, paper or digital, and find your way to John chapter 10, and we will finish out this chapter by looking at uh, verses 22 to 42. And let's begin this morning by uh, asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us through this word today. Holy Spirit, we pray and ask that you would open our eyes to see and our, our ears to hear and our hearts to receive what we're about to read and discuss so that when we go about our lives in the world this week, we will be encouraged to hold fast to the word of Jesus in the midst of the hardships and the difficulties that we might face. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Follow along as I read John chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And the Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? And the Jews answered, It's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? 
And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and Scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I'm the Son of God? If I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. But again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped out of their hands. And he went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained, and many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. This is the word of God. Now, first of all, let me give you an overview of what's going on in this passage, and then we'll come back and focus on the verses that provide the secure foundation for this doctrine of the assurance of salvation. Now, John has been showing us how the Jewish people are divided over who Jesus is, and uh, here we see that the Jewish religious leaders themselves are divided over Jesus. Look back at uh, verse 19, and you'll see that uh, John tells us, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said he has a demon and he's insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of someone who's oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So the Jewish religious leadership is divided in their opinions about Jesus. And as a result, uh, they've not really been able to mount an effective attack against him. But finally, an opportunity for direct confrontation comes uh, while Jesus is visiting the temple in Jerusalem. And John tells us that Jesus was there at the time of the Feast of Dedication, or what we know as Hanukkah, which occurs in mid-December, and most of you know what that is from the Adam Sandler song about Hanukkah, which I am not going to sing this morning. But anyway, now this feast, uh, the Feast of Dedication, was not one of the official festivals that was pre prescribed in the Old Testament. It was instituted by Judas Maccabeus in 165 B.C. to commemorate the cleansing of the temple. And what had happened was the Greeks had come and overrun Israel, and their general, Antiochus Epiphanes, being rather stuck on himself, went into the temple, and he sacrificed a pig on the altar of burnt offering, and he defiled the temple. Well, that caused the Jews to revolt, and there was a great victory over the Greeks. And this festival, this feast, celebrated Antiochus' defeat. So this feast wasn't uh, one of the Old Testament required feasts, but it was important because it was a great time of remembering how God had given victory over uh, the enemies of the people of Israel, and there was a heightened hope that God would send Messiah to come and set the people free. So as Jesus is walking in the temple area, the religious leaders come and say, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Just tell us straight out. If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus replies that he's already told them, and the miracles he's done confirm the fact that he is the Messiah. Now, actually... Jesus had not directly told the Jews in Jerusalem that he was the Christ, the Messiah. Probably because in their minds, the term Christ or Messiah had military overtones. So Jesus avoided using that name, but he did unmistakably claim to be sent from God. He did claim that he and he alone could give eternal life to those who believe in him. He did claim to be the bread of heaven, which came down, uh, the bread of life, which came down from heaven. Uh, he claimed to be the living water that if a person drank uh, from him and believed in him, they would never thirst again. He claimed to be the light of the world and that those who walk in him would never walk in darkness. He claimed to be the good shepherd, like Matt Dinsky talked about last week. And all of those statements were messianic in nature. And besides that, any good Jew would have been able to conclude from looking at Jesus' miracles 
based on Old Testament prophecies that Jesus was doing the things that Messiah would do. And they should be able to conclude that Jesus was the Messiah. And some did, but most did not. Most of them made up their mind that he was not the Messiah. And one thing that you'll find out about Jesus is that he doesn't spend a lot of time trying to convince people who have made up their minds not to believe in him to to believe in him. He didn't cajole, he didn't beg, he didn't threaten, he didn't try to guilt people into following him. He simply came and extended the invitation, you can believe in me or not, and that was it. So Jesus says, you've heard me and seen the miracles, the miraculous works that I've done, but still you don't believe. And then he goes on to say they don't believe because they're not a part of his flock. And on the other hand, he says in verse 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can take them out of my hand. The Father has given them to me and he's greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one, and it's that last statement, I and the Father are one, that infuriates the religious leaders. And so here is yet another time, a third time, that Jesus declares that he is God in the flesh. Basically what he's saying is, as God is, I am. As God is, I am. And lots of people say that Jesus never claimed to be God, but the religious leaders had no question about what Jesus was saying. And according to Old Testament law, to make a claim like that was blasphemy, and it carried the death penalty. So the religious leaders picked up rocks to stone him to death. And that's when Jesus said, okay, for what miraculous work, for what good thing that I've done, are you going to stone me? And they say, we're we're not going to stone you for doing good, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. Now there it is. They knew exactly what Jesus was saying, And I want you to notice that Jesus didn't deny it. Jesus didn't say, oh, oh, wait a minute. You you, you guys thought I I was saying that I was God? Oh, no, 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 no. Nobody should say that. I'm I'm certainly not claiming to be equal with God. No, Jesus didn't back off that. He did not deny their accusation or his claim. And that means he wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a great teacher or a, a martyr who provided us with a good example to follow. No, he was either God in the flesh or he was a deceiver, a cult leader. And we've talked a lot about that in earlier messages. <coughs> so Jesus' enemies knew exactly why he had to die. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. So if that was what Jesus was saying, and again, he didn't deny it. But if that was what Jesus was saying, they had no choice to reject him and kill him as a blasphemer. Again, he didn't deny it. Instead, though, he pushes harder. And he refers back to Psalm 82, 6 to show how that in the Old Testament, God referred to judges who were God's representative. God referred to them as gods, little g, gods. So his point is, so what's the big deal about my claim to be the son of God? I mean, why are you accusing me of blasphemy simply because I refer to myself the way the Uh, the, The Old Testament scriptures refer to other representatives of God. And again, he points them back to the miraculous works that he's done as proof that he is who he claimed to be, but all that fell on deaf ears. They were determined to arrest him, and yet he escaped their grasp and retreated out into the wilderness of Jordan. And John tells us that lots of people came to him there, and they were believing in him. So that's the overview of the passage, but tucked away in this heated argument with the religious leaders is one of the most direct statements regarding eternal security uh, of the believer anywhere in the Bible. So let's look at that. Now, according to verses 27 to 30, eternal security is based on two things. First of all, the sovereignty of God in salvation, and secondly, the certainty of Jesus' promises. The sovereignty of God in salvation and the certainty of Jesus' promises. Number one, the sovereignty of God in salvation. I'm going to start at the back end of this little unit here. 
Uh, verse 29 assures us that those whom God gives to Christ in salvation, he also guards and keeps and protects. The Father guarantees that all those he gives to Jesus are safe and secure. Look at verse 29. My Father who has given them to me. Them who? Well, all those who believe. The sheep who hear Jesus' voice and follow him. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. Now, that's God's promise to you. That's God's unconditional guarantee. If God gave you to Jesus to be one of his sheep, then he has pledged himself to keep you safe and secure, and nothing can change that. So if you've trusted Christ for salvation, then you are God's gift to Jesus, and God has pledged himself that no thing and no one can take you out of his hand. Now, if you do not remember anything else from this message, remember this. The question is not, can a believer lose their salvation? The question is, can God lose one of his children? The question is not, can believers, can Christians lose their salvation? The question is, can God lose one of his children? And the answer is no. Look at it. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of his hand. I don't, I, I don't think it could be any clearer than that. And Now, those who do not believe, once saved, always saved, teach that sin, usually some big sin, will cause a person to lose their salvation. But that runs contrary to the truth that's taught right here, that God guards and keeps those that he gives to Jesus as a gift. It runs contrary to the guarantee that God finishes what he started in us. Now, the fact is, we all sin every single day. None of us, and none of us will be finished products in this life. We all fall short of the mark that God has called us to. What's the mark? The mark is the righteousness of Christ. None of us are going to hit that mark in this life. But the guarantee all through the scripture is that God will finish what he starts. Charles Ryrie, in his book, Basic Theology, def defines eternal security like this. Eternal security is the work of God, which guarantees that the gift of salvation, once received, is forever, and it cannot be lost. Let me say that one more time. Eternal security is the work of God, the work of God, which guarantees the gift of salvation that once it is received, it is forever and it cannot be lost. The doctrine of eternal security emphasizes God's work in salvation, guaranteeing that all who have received eternal life will not lose it. Now, you can lose your car keys, but you cannot lose eternal life because eternal life rests on God's work in saving you, not in you saving yourself. Now, the Apostle Paul makes this point uh, very, very clearly over and over again in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8. Uh, look at these verses, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, that means there's no condemnation of you when you sin. Yep, I mean, God disciplines those he loves. There are consequences to sin, but there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus when they sin. Romans 8, 29 through 30, the apostle writes, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God. In other words, he will finish what he starts to conform us to the righteousness of Christ in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom God predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he will also glorify. So again, salvation is the work of God. And what we see there in Romans 8, 29 and 30 is this unbreakable chain that emphasizes that what God started, he will finish. One more. 
Romans 8, uh, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, coronavirus? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, and we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all of these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Paul says this, for I am convinced that neither life nor death neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, do you see that this big idea here is that if you belong to Jesus, if you are in Christ, no one and no thing, not even you yourself, can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So eternal security, the assurance of your salvation, does not rest on how faithful you are, but in how faithful God is. It doesn't rest on how good you are, but it rests on how good God is. And if that is not enough, we have the certainty of Jesus' promises. That's the, the second thing we see here in this passage, the certainty of Jesus' promises. <laughs> Verses 27 and 28 assure us that those to whom Christ has given eternal life will never perish. Look at it. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I will give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now notice it does not say and they will probably never perish. It does not say and they, and they won't perish if they do not commit some big sin. It says they will never perish. Why not? Because no one is able to snatch them out of Jesus' hand. Now, that's the promise of the good shepherd. That's Jesus' promise to you. God gave you to Jesus. When you trusted Christ, God gave you to Jesus, and Jesus gave you eternal life. Now, in fact, there are four promises here. Promise number one is Jesus says, I give them eternal life. Promise number two is they will never perish. Promise number three is they will never perish. You say, wait a minute, that was number two. Yeah, it was number two, but in the Greek, it's a double negative, meaning they will never, no never, perish. They will never, no never, it's, the, it's, it's, a, it's a double negative and it's a double promise. It's the strongest way to say, absolutely, no way can you, will you ever perish. And then the promise number four is that no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, those two truths, the sovereignty of God and salvation and the certainty of Jesus' promises are the two hands that hold us. No one can snatch us out of Jesus' hand, and the Father who is greater than all, nobody can snatch us out of his hand. You are in the double grip of God's grace, and God will never, no never, let you go. I mean, think about that. Is there anything greater than God, more powerful than God, who could rip you out of his hand? Absolutely not. I mean, is there anything that would make Jesus break his promise to you? Absolutely not. Listen, you say, well, what if I don't want to be held in his hand anymore? What if I want to jump out of his hand? Well, you, you can jump out, but you're not strong enough to break the, the, the grip of the Father and the Son uh, on you. You're not strong enough to do that. God the Father and God the Son will never let you go if you've truly trusted Christ for salvation. So eternal security, the assurance of salvation, is grounded in God's power and Christ's promise, not your performance. Now, listen, I understand that there are a lot of Christians in a lot of churches who believe that Christians can lose their salvation. But if you believe that, then you've got to define a whole lot of other, you've got to redefine a whole lot of other Bible truths. There are a lot of other Bible truths that lose their meaning and power if you give up 
the doctrine of eternal security. And I want to give you some of those Bible truths that don't make sense anymore if you let go of once saved, always saved. It, because when, when you let that domino fall, everything else falls after them. Like, like what? Like, number one, if you let go of eternal security, then unconditional love really doesn't mean anything. There's no such thing as unconditional love because you believe that you can do something or not do something that causes you to lose your salvation. Now, if, if you believe that, then your relationship to God is conditioned on your obedience, and that means you're on a performance basis with God. And that means that what you do determines whether God loves you or not. So if your salvation is conditioned on what you do or don't do, there is no such thing as unconditional love. Now, number two, another thing you have to redefine is grace. Basically, eternal security is based on the grace of God uh, and the fact that eternal life is a gift. So what does this passage teach us? It teaches us that Jesus gifts you eternal life and God gifts you to Jesus. So to reject eter eternal security, you have to believe that you are saved by some combination of faith and works because your salvation depends, listen, your salvation depends in part on what you do or what you must continue to do in order to stay saved. Now let me tell you, this is serious stuff. In fact, if you don't believe in eternal security, you may not be saved at all. Now, how can I say, I know, I, I know that's, that's serious, but, but listen to me here. How can I say that? Two reasons. Number one, Jesus promises to give eternal life to those who believe him for it. So if you believe in Christ, what do you receive? Eternal life. So how ridiculous is it then to say that you believe in Christ for eternal life and then turn around and say, but you're not sure you have it or that you can keep it? In other words, how can someone say they believe in Jesus' promise to give him eternal life for salvation, um, but then not be sure that they have it? Eternal life is the very thing that you're believing Jesus for. And it makes no sense for you to believe in him, or say you believe in him, and then say, well, I hope I have it, or I'm afraid I might lose it. No, saving faith is believing that Jesus will do for you what he's promised to do. And he promises to give you eternal life if you believe in him. So if you don't believe you have it, how is that saving faith? Now the second reason, and I'm not saying this lightly, hear me. The second reason you might not be saved is because salvation is by grace through faith and not of works, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Meaning, if you are depending in any way on your works to attain or maintain salvation, then your faith is misplaced. If you're depending on anything other than Christ, his finished work on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins and for the gift of eternal life, then you are not saved according to the Bible. Let me put it this way. If you redefine grace as faith plus works, then you do not believe the gospel of the New Testament. It is faith alone in Christ alone that equals salvation. And Romans eleven six 6 says, if it is by works, then it cannot be by grace. They're oil and water. If it is faith plus baptism, or faith plus church membership, or faith plus what you do or you don't do, that is not saving faith. It's a works-based salvation. And those of you that maybe know your Bible, that's what it means in Galatians. When Paul is warning uh, the believers there that, and he's saying that you have fallen from grace, and people who believe you can lose your salvation will go to this passage and say, we'll see there, the Galatians fell from grace. They lost their salvation. No, that's not what it means. Grace and salvation are not synonyms. Grace is the means of salvation. It is not salvation. And what Paul is saying is that these Galatians had begun to mix faith plus circumcision, faith plus works, and they had fallen from a grace way of salvation. 
salvation and they had, were going back to a works-based way of salvation. They were drifting back into this faith plus works thing and so they had fallen away from grace. So listen to me. It is a dangerous thing to depend on anything other than, the, than grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone for salvation. So if you don't believe in eternal security, you're gonna have to redefine all of that. And that's a dangerous thing as far as I'm concerned. Number three, if you reject etern eternal security, then you have to redefine forgiveness. Forgiveness is at stake. Now let me ask you, when Jesus died on the cross, for which of your sins did he die? Well, you said, well, he died for all of them, past, present, and future. Okay, well, think. If sins you commit after becoming a, a Christian can cause you to lose your salvation, then clearly those sins were not covered at Calvary, which also redefines what happens at the cross. Forgiven means forgiven past, present, and future, and the sins that Jesus died to save you from were all future from the perspective of the cross. So you have to redefine uh, uh, forgiveness. Number four, you have to rede redefine eternal life. Now, we like to stress, and I'm gonna come to this in just a minute, we like to stress the qualitative nature of eternal life. This life of personal intimacy with Christ, life that you have with him now, lived in the presence of God, not just in the sky by and by. And that is true. And again, I'll talk about that. That's number six. But every Greek lexicon defines eternal as meaning without beginning or end. Without beginning or end. In other words, if you received the gift of eternal life, eternal life, it can't be lost tomorrow or next year. It is simply, it would not be eternal if you could lose it. Eternal doesn't mean now you have it, now you don't. Eternal life is everlasting life. It starts the moment of faith and goes on uninterrupted into eternal, etern eternity. And so if you reject eternal security, then what is eternal life? Number five, the nature of salvation itself. You've gotta redefine the nature of salvation itself. As I said earlier, you can lose your car keys, but you can't lose your salvation because salvation is not something. It is not some commodity that you hold in your hand and then it can be taken out of your hand. It's not like that. Salvation has to do with a fundamental change in the deepest part of who you are. It's a change in your relationship with God. You were dead in trespasses and sins, dead spiritually dead. And when you put your faith and trust in Christ, God put his Holy Spirit in you as a permanent resident, as a seal, as a guarantee, as a down payment of your future salvation. And you were made spiritually alive. Old things passed away, and you became a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So you cannot be a new creation, then revert back to an old creation, then, then start living right, and now you become a new creation again. It doesn't work that way. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. It's not now you have it, now you don't. And that's why the Bible uses the term that we were born again or born from above to explain the fundamental change that takes place in your nature when you believe in Christ for salvation. Just like I will forever be the son of Frank and Betty Boyd. Uh, genetically and physically, nothing can change the, that fact. I'm irrevocably linked to them. Now, I can change my name, but my DNA will always show that I am vitally linked to that family, to my family line. And again, that's why Jesus, when he was talking to Nicodemus, that's why he uses such strong language to describe what happens when you're reborn spiritually. When you trust Christ for salvation, you experience spiritual birth. You are born again. Your spiritual DNA, which was dead, 
becomes alive and you're vitally linked to Jesus through the Holy Spirit, the permanent resident living in you, you're vitally linked to the Father and nothing, no nothing can ever change that. Salvation can't be taken out of you and then put back in. You can't have it today and not have it tomorrow and that leads to number six. If you reject eternal security, you also have to redefine intimacy with Christ. You see, eternal security is much more than simply having the guarantee of where you will spend eternity. It's the perfect term to describe the intimacy we have with Jesus because we are secure in his love. And if you've trusted Christ for salvation, you are secure in his love. You are secure in his forgiveness, secure in his accepting you just as you are, even though he will be relentless to work in your life to make you more like Jesus. He's, he's accepted you just as you are, but he's not going to leave you just as you are. Now, listen to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 13. The apostle Paul, he, uh, he knows exactly what, I'm, uh, what we're saying here uh, about eternal security. He says, if we are faithless, God remains faithful, now listen to this, because he cannot deny himself. He cannot deny himself that, that, that the Holy Spirit that lives in us, he remains faithful because he can't deny what has happened when he put his Holy Spirit into us and we became his children. Now, I, I hear you, you're saying, well, if that's true, then I, I can just go out and live however I wanna live. No, listen, if you have truly trusted Christ to save you from your sin, then why would you want to willfully live in the sin that Jesus died to save you from? Doesn't make any sense. Theologian Henry Thiessen was preaching on eternal security one time and someone came up to him after the service and they said, if I believed as you do, I would live as I pleased. And Thiessen calmly replied, well, that would be the best evidence that you do not believe as I do. I mean, how can anyone who wants to live in, in the sin that Jesus died to save them from say that they have trusted Christ to forgive their sin? It doesn't make any sense. Now, I wanna make this clear. <clears throat> Nowhere in scripture does God promise eternal life to people who do religious things. No raising the hand and going forward at an evangelistic crusade, no signing a card, no walking an aisle, no prayer, no church membership, no catechism class, no baptism, no sacrificial act of service, no giving your money, None of those things make you a Christian. No good thing you do, no bad things you don't do make you a Christian. Only those who know they have a need to be forgiven of their sin. They know they're sinners, they know they need to be forgiven of their sins, and they trust Jesus to save them from their sin and to give them eternal life. Only those people are truly saved. So, if a person says they have trusted Christ for salvation, but at some point they fall away and they're no longer living for God, does that mean that they were never saved to start with? Well, maybe, because the issue was, the issue is once saved, right? That is, were they once saved? Once saved, always saved. The question is, were they once saved? But the problem lies in what they first believed, not in how they behave. The problem is, what did you believe when you say that you were once saved? So the question is, what did they believe when they first believed? Were they just joining a church? Were they just accepting their parents' faith, but it never became a personal faith? Did they just believe a series of facts and the statements about Jesus, but never really came to believe in him and place their faith squarely on him? Did they get come forward at, at, at a retreat or a camp or in a church and get baptized because all their friends were doing it? Was their faith a religious faith, meaning 
Did they believe that, that salvation was some kind of mixture of faith plus baptism or faith plus church tradition or whatever? Or did they truly trust in Christ alone for salvation? Did they come to an inner conviction, a settled persuasion that Jesus was God's only answer to save them from their sins and they trusted Christ and him alone for their personal savior? Now, if that was true of them, if, if, if you've truly trusted Christ, then, then I have to allow for the possibility that true believers can fall away and come under the loving discipline of their heavenly father and even forfeit future rewards. True Believers can wander away, be led astray, become dull in hearing, fall into terrible sin, become hard-hearted, and bring serious consequences on themselves and those around them, consequences that might actually be lifelong consequences. So it's very serious for a believer to fall into sin and wander away. It, now let me ask you another question. As to the question, can you know for sure that God has forgiven all your sin, past, present, and future, and that you have life with God now, and uh, heaven is guaranteed after you died? Well, according to Jesus' answer right here, the answer is yes, absolutely. You can absolutely know for sure. You, you, can, you can know for sure because, because the assurance of your salvation rests on God's power and on Jesus' promises, not your performance, and eternal security rests on the double grip of God's grace on your life. Now, back in the early 90s, uh, there was a newspaper article in Florida about a 12-year-old boy named Michael who lived in a house that bumped right up against a lake. And one day, Michael was out um, snorkeling behind his house, and he was totally unaware that there was this huge alligator that was bearing down on him. Neighbors spotted the gator headed towards him and they began yelling to try to warn Michael, but he couldn't hear them. But uh, Michael's mother inside the house heard the neighbors and she comes running out of the house down to the lake, lake's edge, just in time to watch the alligator lunge for her son's head and its teeth slashing a six inch wound in his scalp. Now, miraculously, the boy's head came free and he began to frantically swim to shore, but the alligator was, was after him. And, and uh, this time, uh, the mother ran into the water to save her son and as she reached out to grasp her son's hand, the beast's huge jaw, jaws snapped shut on the boy's leg and what followed was this tug of war between this 100 pound mother and this 400 pound 11 foot alligator. And clutching her boy's hand in a death grip, she pulled with superhuman strength and suddenly the alligator let go and the mother drug her son to safety. Now, fortunately and miraculously, Michael didn't suffer any severe injuries. And uh, about three months later, he was being interviewed by someone and, and he was showing them the spot where the whole thing took place and, and he showed them his, how his head had pretty much uh, healed and uh, there were only a few signs of, uh, of, uh, of his brush with death. Scars on his head were now covered by hair and, and several of the scars on his leg were covered by, by socks but he proudly showed off three small scars on the back of his right hand, inflicted not by the alligator, but by his mother's fingernails. She had literally drawn blood when she pulled him from the jaws of death. Now, I love that story, a boy saved by his mother's death grip and think about it, if that mother would not let go of her son, do you think Jesus would let go of you? Do you think the father would let go of you? No way. We are held in the, gift, in the grip of God's grace and he will never, no, never let us go. And it's the 
nail-pierced scars in Jesus' hands that give us that assurance. So if you've trusted Jesus for your salvation, that should take a load off your mind. Sound theology has a way of doing that. Amen.